The year was 1950. Five years prior, Japan had just lost the Second World War, and was still four years away from classics such as Seven Samurai and Gojira, two films that would go down as some of the most well-known movies to ever come out of the country. Seven Samurai, of course, being the first globally renowned samurai film, and Gojira being the Japanese monster movie that kickstarted a whole cinematic universe of kaiju films. However, the worldwide success of those films in 1954 may have looked different if it were not for another Japanese film that came out in 1950, a film that many say put Japanese cinema on the map and caused it to gain the attention it so rightly deserved around the world. That film, of course, being Akira Kurosawa's masterpiece, Rashomon. Now the first thing we need to ask ourselves before we go any further, is Rashomon even a samurai film? And of course, to understand that, we have to take another look at the question of what even makes a film a samurai film. Does simply having samurai in the film make it such, or does there have to be a set list of elements within the film that transform it into what we can consider a samurai film? So then, does Rashomon contain samurai? Yes, only one. Is it about samurai? No, not at all. However, it is still set in feudal Japan and pushes the mindset of those living in feudal Japan to the forefront, examining feudal Japanese social status and norms in a completely unique way. A way that we will see can even be taken and metaphorized. So in the sense of other samurai films like Seven Samurai, Yojimbo, and Harakiri, it's nothing akin to those, or perhaps every samurai film made after 1954. Yet it still does have strong roots to feudal Japan, and is incredibly significant for other reasons, reasons I will try to elaborate on in this review. However, it will be hard to do so without spoilers, so unfortunately this is not a spoiler-free review if you have not seen Rashomon. Which you should really go do, because it's usually at the top of many lists ranking films that you should watch before you die. Rashomon was released at a time when Japanese film wasn't necessarily a blip on the radar to the rest of the world. While Hollywood was pumping out hundreds of films a year, Japanese cinema was going largely undiscovered outside of Japan. That is until 1950, when an up-and-coming Japanese filmmaker named Akira Kurosawa released a film that even the film studio producing it believed was destined to fail. In fact, by the time of its release, it was on its second film studio because the first one, the famous Toho Studios, had backed out believing the film was a disaster. Initially, critics in Japan tore the film apart. For them, the film was too hard to follow, and by the end, it felt meaningless. However, when it began receiving positive reviews abroad, Japanese critics were shocked. This led many Japanese film critics to even throw out excuses that foreign audiences only liked it because it was different and exotic to them. Nevertheless, Rashomon would go on to appear at the Venice Film Festival in 1951 and even win an honorary Academy Award in 1952 for Best Foreign Film, being largely credited for being the reason why that Academy Award category was even created. Rashomon was an obvious critical success outside of Japan and made the world look at Japanese cinema differently from that point on. But why is that? What did Rashomon do that made it stand out? What it comes down to is how Kurosawa decided to tell the story, or rather, adapt the story. You see, the plot of Rashomon is actually based off of a short story written by Runotsuke Akutagawa that was published in 1922 titled In a Grove. The actual title of the film is taken from a completely separate Akutagawa story. For the most part, Kurosawa follows the plot of In a Grove rather closely, yet the main difference comes in how Kurosawa actually orders the events of the story and it's for this reason that the film was so well received. The film and story center around the murder of a samurai and the rape of his wife, supposedly by an infamous thief named Tajomaru. The thief, who was eventually apprehended, is brought before the law, where everyone present from him, to the wife, to the disembodied spirit of the dead samurai husband, all give their account of what happened. We also receive a fourth and final account later on from a woodcutter who happened to be a witness. The problem, however, is that each account is vastly different, thus everyone ends up contradicting each other. It is this form of storytelling that truly won over foreign critics, as it had never been seen before on film. What is considered a modern cliché in courtroom dramas today was first introduced right here. 
It even went on to coin its own unique term used in cinema today and can be found in the dictionary, the Rashomon effect, where a story is told differently through several different perspectives with no clear truth. This was seen as stunning and unique for its time, and is what helped make it so successful, along with the fact that it also had great acting and innovative camera work. This method of storytelling would of course be used time and time again by other filmmakers, with my personal favorite take on it being the 2002 Chinese film Hero. Yet, while other films have a clear ending, Rashomon is a bit more ambiguous, as by the end of the film it's still not necessarily clear what the purpose or message behind the story is. Supposedly, even the cast after reading the script came to Kurosawa with questions of what does it all mean, only for Kurosawa to answer that the story is a reflection of life, and that life doesn't always have a clear meaning. What is clear about the story is the setup, a murder through the eyes of four different individuals. To paint the picture, a woodcutter played by Takashi Shimura discovers the body of a murdered samurai in a forest. Later we learn the samurai and his wife were making their way through the woods when they encountered the notorious thief Tajomaru, played brilliantly by a young Toshiro Mifune. Tajomaru, the only named character in the film, upon seeing the beautiful wife, devises a plan to steal her away from her samurai husband. Tajomaru convinces the samurai to momentarily leave his wife so that he can take him to a nearby spot filled with riches from a raided tomb where Tajumaru will then offer his findings to the samurai in exchange for compensation. Going against every base instinct that this samurai should possess, he allows his greed to overtake him and follows Tajumaru into what is an obvious trap. Tajumaru subdues the samurai, then returns for the wife, bringing her before her husband so that she can see how useless he is before raping her. And this is where the story diverges, as each individual tells their own version of what happened next, as by the end of each account, the samurai is dead, the wife has escaped, and Tajumaru has gone his separate way. Only later, after his capture, is he and the wife brought before the law so that a trial can be held. Although, what should be a simple murder trial is instead a complete fiasco, with everyone insisting that their version of events is the correct version. There is a reason for this, and it is preservation of one's honor. This is where you can see every character impacted by a feudal Japanese mindset, each of them wishing to be perceived in a positive and noble light. Tajomaru wishes to be seen as an honorable and cunning thief, not raping the wife, but seducing her, and honorably dueling the husband to the death. The wife wishes to be perceived as a victim to both Tajomaru and the cruelty of her husband. She knows her status in society and knows she is now defiled. She feels hatred emanating towards her from her husband and decides to not only kill him, but attempt to kill herself. The husband wishes to preserve his honor after suffering such a disgrace, taking his own life after allowing Tajumaru to not only deceive him, but also rape his wife. Thus, in each of their versions, they are the killer. The woodcutter's version of events is the only account that isn't directly involved. Yet, once we learn why he didn't tell his story to the law, we discover he is more directly intertwined than we are initially led to believe. His version too showcases each individual affected by a feudal Japanese mindset, with the wife coming out as perhaps having more of a backbone than Tajimaru or her husband, as we see her suppressed societal role causes her to eventually have an outburst against the hypocrisy of the two men's position. By the end of the first viewing, you may think you have a clear idea of whose story you believe is correct. Yet, if you haven't watched it again, I challenge you to. As i found with each repeated viewing, I find something new that changes my perspective. Simple background details or odd character actions that force me to rethink my entire previous assumption. This is what makes Rashomon so special. The fact that it's not clear cut allows us to interpret it all so many different ways. And it's because of this, we can also look to interpret Rashomon as a metaphor. Not only for how history can be interpreted through many different perspectives, but particularly in regards to the different mindsets in Japan after the end of the Second World War. Should the Japanese look to the war as an honorable quest? A failed and cruel crusade? A shameful and unfortunate defeat? Or perhaps a combination of all the above? 
Kurosawa decides to end the film on an uplifting note, signaling that although dark times have happened in the past, there are brighter times ahead. And it's in that final scene we see that even though the woodcutter isn't entirely innocent, he still is capable of being a good and just person. This is in direct comparison to the Japanese after World War II. Although there are many perspectives on what the war was to them, they can still strive to be good people in the future. I can easily give Rashomon a full four stars. While it is not a direct samurai film, its setting in feudal Japan and feudal mindsets by each character still make it a very valid review for this channel. It is a film I highly recommend that you check out, yet please take the time to watch it more than once and allow your mind some time to breathe in between, as you might just discover a whole new perspective that you didn't have the previous viewing. So then, have you seen Rashomon? If so, what do you think about it? Let me know in the comments below. And of course, thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most entertaining.